So I got to interview the dude that owns all of the St. Louis Taco Bells I grew up eating at and gaining weight at, the biggest broker in St. Louis. If the new business owner were to add um, extra income streams or revenue streams to that business, would that factor into the valuation? So if... And then that fourth year it hits and that fifth year is bigger and better. That is a historic cash flow that shows a growth in cash flow. A lot of these channels, like he said, there's a lot of entrepreneurs selling, you know, training and courses. And that's one of the first things they, they talk you to is the seller financing because they know your desire. All right, guys, we are back with an interview and you guys have been waiting for this one all week. We have brought the source. We have hacked into the Matrix mainframe uh, for you guys, and we brought a man that's going to change your life, whether you're looking uh, to buying a business or whether you're looking to have direct access to business owners that need help. And I'm going to allow him to introduce himself as well as Curtis as well. Uh, Curtis, let him go, and then you go and give everybody your, your rundown as well. Mr. Rook, you can go. All right. Well, my name is Peter Rook. Um, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be here. I greatly appreciate it. I am the owner of Sunbelt Business Advisors of St. Louis, Missouri. Sunbelt Business Advisors is a national franchise. It started in 1978. We're a global franchise. We facilitate the buying and selling of main street businesses. What am I, what I mean by main street businesses, typically businesses below $3 million in annual revenue. So we not only help people that are ready to sell, but we also help people prepare to sell as well as help buyers that are looking um, to get into an acquisition uh, help them fine tune their search search characteristics such that they make a good investment decision that's backed up with power and passion of their energy. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. That's excellent, uh, Curtis Witt. Uh, you guys know me uh, with uh, partner uh, agency to partner and really don't want to go into it. I want to really get into uh, what we have in terms of the interview. So we'll just keep going, David. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Curtis is being a, in, uh, being a good good cop. <laughs> okay. I'll be back. Uh, Curtis, he's bought many businesses, and he's sold businesses as well. So that is his expertise on this. I am the marketing and advertising expert, and we join forces to help agency owners free themselves and unshackle themselves from the chains of oppression of uh, the traditional agency model. So we want you guys to become owners and partners of business owners as well, instead of just having them as clients. So the bridge for that gap is Mr. Rook today. And we're going to ask him a few questions so you guys can get the insight on the industry, whether you're looking to buy, he, he'll be able to help you with that. Or whether you're looking to partner with the business owners, he'll be able to help you guys with that as well. Uh, so we'll start with the first question, Mr. Uh, Rook. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and your experience in brokering? Well, I have kind of a roundabout uh, experience in brokering because in 1998, I became a Taco Bell franchise and I brokered a 12 store deal under a mi minority act. I'm half Hispanic and my partner uh, was Afro American. I bought 12 Taco Bell restaurants under Ooh. a minority program. So that was our first acquisition. And then we um, ended up buying another 17, all here in the St. Louis market. So right. I participated in that acquisition. Right. So over the course of conducting business, I bought and sold various businesses that were either helping me vertically integrate and reduce cost efficiency, create cost efficiency, um, 
for all of the facilities that, that I have, whether it was landscaping or facility maintenance. So then I ended up uh, retiring, selling my restaurants and uh, using my knowledge to help people buy things. And I said, finally, I, I might as well start making some money doing this. So sure. I bought a help franchise and here we go. Boom, boom. <laughs> Hey, that's a Cinderella story right there. You hear me? And that's awesome. So y'all pretty much dominated the Taco Bell game in St. Louis, man. So I'm from, I'm from St. Louis, so I'm pretty sure I've eaten it one or, one or two oh, of you. Oh, I bet you have. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay. Um, Curtis, do you want to ask him the second question? No, David, you, you keep going. Keep going. Okay. Keep rolling. Okay, okay. So, um, how do you approach the valuation of a business and uh, what factors do you consider most critical? Well, there's two components to evaluating a business. There is a book value, which is created by the financial performance of the business. And then there's an intangible value, which is the value of the location, the brand, if it's a franchise, the value of the franchise fee, um, or it could just be standard goodwill of being in a location for 30 years um, okay. or doing a business for 30 years and having a huge clientele. So the true valuation for a business is based on a combination of those. But the true pricing, we recommend market pricing uh, using comparables and industry multiples. But when you think of buying a business, it's worth what you're willing to pay for it. <laughs> and that's what we look at. That's how we coach our sellers is to understand, take the path out of it. Look at what book value is try to put a value on the intent try to put, and then see how, if it's bankable can somebody get a loan to buy it can they afford to pay for that loan and have something left for a livable wage component and that's pretty much the uh the process in um as far as valuation goes in the number nice nice man hey I hope y'all are taking notes. I hope y'all are taking notes, okay? Um, if you if you would, could you share um, a quick success story where you managed to sell a particularly challenging uh, listing? Well, um, they all have their unique challenges. Um, I would say the biggest challenge in my industry is trying to come in and sell a business that's overpriced. Hmm. Um, most most sellers um, have a big a big passion about their business, which drives their their tangible perception of value. Yeah. So, the biggest challenge is every day the challenge of managing the seller's perception of value by showing them a clear financial valuation so they understand what how a bank right. is going to look at their business For sure. That's okay. just getting sellers exactly. to their business right so it will back somebody okay. can buy okay that kind of reminds me of uh, with real estate when you when a real estate agent is trying to um you know sell the home they have to calculate the after repair value and tell the homeowner like what is really worth because they have, they're thinking about all their memories and how they raise their kids there. That that doesn't matter to the person that's going to buy the property, right? So, yeah, right. it doesn't remind me of that. Okay. Um, how do you qualify potential buyers to ensure uh, a good fit for the business being sold? Okay. How we approach buyer qualification is from the seller's perspective. So as we were talking about mm -hmm. prior, the valuation, coming up with a sales price that can't bank, that's so calculate monthly payment 
based on a down payment. And so when I when I, when a buyer in a listing, other than general questions of qualifications, whether it experience in that particular field or the amount of time they want to invest in the business. The, the primary is mm -hmm. how much money do you have to put down? Okay. Because financing can work, whether it's a bank loan, we're seeing a lot of seller financing. The key is you can't right. afford the payment that you're required to buy this business. Okay. Man, okay. All right. I don't even right. have this question on here, but you just made a good point. Can you tell people the difficulties of, of getting a business owner to agree to seller financing, please? I, I know that's not on the list of questions, but a lot of people try to use that as some type of escape can, uh, or hack. Can you, uh, you know, tell them the difficulties of seller financing? Arrows. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Seller financing is a big topic in the marketplace today. As more and more people yep. try to escape this corporate life and get into their own business, there's a lot of programs out there that are made by other entrepreneurs who have entrepreneurs. various businesses with no money down. And that is a an opportunity that's out there, but it is limited in scope. So putting it in reality yeah. terms of everyday Main Street business, if you were looking at your seller, there's two things that as a buyer you need to have. One is you have to have good credit and and potential some collateral. Two, you have to either have in the business you're buying, or you have to make commitment to the owner to participate in what we call an earnout structure, where you're learning on the job, they're training you, and eventually they're they're carrying or financing the business. But all sellers are going to require, I would say, no less than a twenty percent down payment to mm. show you're actually throwing some skin in the game. Mm. Okay, man. I, I appreciate that, that bonus and that because a lot of people don't know that. Um, a lot of people think that you just want to just like a lot of people in bad situations, they try to go the seller financing route. But you just cleared up a lot of stuff. Typically, you're going to need decent credit or good credit, and you you probably need 20% down. So, guys, don't look at seller financing. I'm not saying seller financing doesn't work. Obviously, it does. But don't look at that as some, some like, savior uh, tactic or something like that. Be prepared for the worst. Be prepared to have to go all in. Be prepared that you might even, might not even be able to get approved or get a business owner to agree to sell a finance. And, and this is why agency, the partner, we're partnering with these brokers and stuff. They're going to handle like negotiations for you guys, uh, uh, you know, so that for those of you who do want to buy uh, and for the agencies, uh, the agencies that want to partner with the brokers, you guys will be able to help them make uh, the listings more attractive and make it to where the business businesses are actually uh, worth what they're trying to sell for and everything like that. Right. So, but for those of you who are trying to buy guys, like a lot of these channels, like he said, there's a lot of entrepreneurs selling, you know, training and courses. And that's one of the first things they, they talk you to is the seller financing because they know your desire. They, they know your weakness. Your weakness is the fact that you don't have a lot of money or good credit. But even with me right now, this is the first time I'm really hearing about you needing a good credit. This is my my first time hearing about uh, you probably more than likely are going to need the 20% down. Like I knew in, in, a, in some cases you will need to put something down. Like I knew that. But 
Like, this is what me and Curtis was talking to you guys about the other day, about it's going to have to be, you, people tell you it's a numbers game. Okay, now you got to go through a lot of numbers. If you're trying to do the stellar financial thing, you're going to have to go through a lot of numbers before you get somebody to agree to your bad credit and, and your, your lack of down payment uh, resources and stuff. You're going to have to go through crazy, crazy numbers. So why even like go that route? But anyway, let's let's move on. Uh, well, can I, can I add something to the conversation? Oh, yes, sir. Two things. Absolutely. The, the zero seller finance game is the reason why the the cost of entry is low is because targeting businesses that are failing or have failed. And the only reason why they're still open is because they're probably providing, generating enough income to support the sole owner. Now, yep. we see that a lot. The big, the, the big problem is in our industry, which is a part of the seller finance, is especially trade entrepreneurs, let's say a guy that's in the transmission business. And he he has a shop that uh, manufactures or remanufactures a certain part that goes to rebuild transmission. Those guys are disappearing off the face of the earth. Now, what they can't find anybody to work. So what I'm pioneering, and I'll make the goal the cool now, and I'm in the grassroots phase, is I'm coming up with a with a project that's called Dirty Jobs Math. And what that means is that we're trying to identify people, identify people trade that have a good credit that may or may have some money but are willing to commit to becoming a earn out left the owner, meaning that they would partner with one of these entrepreneurs that is completely aging out a, a needed industry in a shrinking uh, uh, employment market of capable people to take on this business. And they would learn how to like make this particular part and it Earn then, they would have an earn out of X amount of years. The owner would mentor them. They would have a great niche business because you would have low competitive, no, low competition, right? Because you're in a, let's take the transmission part, for example. In St. Louis, there's got to be 5 million cars that still have transmission. Well, there's this, the amount of transmission stores are shrinking, right? For the average person can't afford to go to a dealership and get a brand new one. They have to get a rebuilt one. And, you know, if your car is 15 years old, where do you go to get a transmission? There's millions of cars. There's two shops in St. Louis that do it, right? Yeah. I had one I, I met with the other day. Can't find anybody to work. Well, here's an opportunity. If a guy had some motivation, we had some passion in that business, I could maybe match that that hardworking guy with a dirty jobs future that has high margin, Boom. income stability, revenue stability, and he's creating his own legacy. For sure, for sure. Yeah, see, that's genius right there, man. It's about partnerships and matchups. Yeah, that's what I try to tell them, man. Like, it makes it a lot easier. If people would just be a little creative, wouldn't have to go through the struggles and everything. Um, okay, all right. So what are some of your key strategies for negotiating deals between buyers and sellers? Well, if the business is priced correctly, which is the, the, the main objective of a broker is not to price the business so it will sell fast. It's to price it appropriately based on 
the current cash flow, the opportunity for growing that cash flow stream, mm. and the reasonable sustainability of the business model you're in. And so when we when when buyers come to us, we prepare them for what the business is worth. So the this is the discussion comes to a debate over the value of the intangibles. What is that location worth? What is your brand worth if it's a local brand? So your local brand, what is Cyberg's worth, right? Yeah. So, it, you know, if you have your mom and pops, even though you may only have a couple locations or one location, you have brand value. If I say Jerry Kelly in St. Louis, you know, you know it's heating and cooling, right? Yeah, yeah. So sure. that has a value to that brand above and beyond the cash because he's invested in marketing to build that name. So typically, we don't argue book value because book value is proven. This is how much cash you make. Sure. This, is, this is what your industry multiple this is your most probable price. The discussion becomes over the intangibles. Okay. Okay. It's something else you said in there. You said cash flow potential. Like, can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So historical cash flow is a significant um, is a significant uh, uh, driver to future cash flow. So okay. if let's say you have a business for five years and the first three years are just tough and then that fourth year it hits and that fifth year is bigger and better, that is a historic cash flow that shows a growth in cash flow. So as oh. a banker looks at your business, he looks at your historical cash flow trends to establish if it's going in the right direction or if it's going in the wrong. Now, mm. if it's going in the wrong direction, doesn't mean it's a bad business. It could just be a bad operator running a good business. True, true, true. I agree. I agree with that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, if the new business owner were to add um, extra income streams or revenue streams to that business that doesn't require any uh labor costs would that factor into the valuation no because the main street valuation is based on historical cash flow or historical profits not okay. on future or what we call leaning profits okay cool 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 okay those were just some questions that weren't even on the list <laughs> Okay, all right, we are we're almost because I know you're out and about. All right, quick. So question. how do you how do you identify and target the right buyer demographic for hard to sell listings? Hmm. Well, it's not it's actually not so much of buyer demographics, other than it's more in line with buyer. Buyer passion combined with investment objectives. Okay. So in other words, your standard buyer out there is going to look for a 20% return on investment with a return on capital within 60 months. Okay. Cool. On average, and those are, the uh, two, those are the two things you look for. Okay. In, cool. in a good investment. Cool. On average, um, how long does it typically take for one of those deals to close? Our average sales cycle is nine to 12 months. Now okay. the sales cycle can't, yeah. how we, how his, the sales cycle is affected by the price. Mm. So as we go into our pricing discussions with our sellers, we always look to the seller as what is their timeline of selling the business. If they don't, if they're not in a hurry, 
Then we price it a little higher on the premium side because we have time to wait. If okay. they really want to make an impact and sell it fast, we have them price it a little more aggressively. Now, okay. as we were talking about the bankability, think of this. The bankability of a business that you're buying goes increases as the sale price decreases, right? Because right. your debt payment gets lower. So that's why sellers who really want to make a quick exit um, usually don't get the kind of returns they're looking for. They leave money on the on the table. <laughs> so if you're hey. if you're looking to, if you're looking to buy a business and save money, look for one that the person wants to get out quick. Yeah, I heard that, man. Yeah, I heard that, and they usually leave money on the table. The table. This, this is why I, uh, we we can help and be saviors to a lot of these business sellers, right? Uh, <laughs> because that's crazy okay all right so let's move on because i'll start rambling all right um how do you determine when and how to adjust the valuation of a listing to make it more attractive to a buyer okay well the valuation never changes the book value of the the book valuation never changes the price can change okay oh so, but the value is always the same Okay. So when you look at, um, if you lower the price, the seller proceeds are less. Okay. So any price reduction is usually driven by a, a combination of things. One, lack of interest. And so what we do for our, our sellers is once a month, we get a listing uh, activity report from let's say biz buy sell which is one of the, the largest online business selling platforms and so i can pick any listing and i look at it and i see how many views how many hits how many click throughs how many saves and so what we do is gradually maybe every one to two months if we're not getting hits we'll change a picture change a message highlight the financials if the again if the numbers are getting better, we highlight that to reflect that to keep driving eyeballs and having a fresh look. Um, we have, because what's very interesting is that when a listing hits, it takes about five months, then all of a sudden the gates open. Unless it's mm -hmm. priced extremely aggressive, then right out of the box, it'll, it'll ha get a lot of activity. Cool. Okay. In your experience, um, I know this is a, a complex and probably like a uh, situational question. Anyway, um, in your in your experience, do uh, do do buyers enjoy buying uh, higher or lower? And I guess that depends on the type of. I just you know the reason why I'm asking is because me like if I'm going. If I'm going shopping and I'm feeling good and I want something valuable, I usually look for the most expensive thing. But if I'm just trying to go and get something like a gym shirt or something, then I probably, you, you see what I'm saying? So yeah. the, the buyers that you deal with on, on, uh, on a regular basis, are they typically looking for, you know, higher end businesses? Well, you know, you have um, a full range because we sell anything from 50000 all the way up to $10 million. Okay. So what you find, though, is the buyers under 300000 are much, uh, they're, uh, they're much uh, more comprehensive to deal with. Because okay. at that range, that investment is likely a very large percentage of their net worth. Mm -hmm. And so they want every I dotted and every T crossed, which is completely understandable. Yeah, now, exactly. as you get higher up the spectrum, 
Um, the the attention to detail is just driven on different things, right? Okay. And so um, it's really easier to sell a two million dollar business than it is a two hundred thousand. <laughs> hey, hey, tell them again. Hey, we tell you guys this <laughs> all the time for y'all penny pinchers and people that are afraid to raise their prices and stuff. P well, you gotta have there, money. You gotta have that twenty. You gotta have yeah. that twenty. Yeah, it's people out there that are willing to just throw down, you know, a few million dollars just because it's convenient. A lot, like he said, the people that are coming with less than the three hundred are going to be more of the <laughs> those type of people. You know, what I'm saying no offense, but yeah, yeah man, like taken. And we help those people every day. And, yeah. You know, that's kind of the pleasure of doing the business it, in our business is seeing new first time entrepreneurs coming in the business. And so in, in, in preparation and knowing that we're going to have that, we have some of the best marketing materials, education wise for new buyers and for new sellers such right. that if they follow the process it's not very cumbersome for them because that's why they hire us. Okay. The biggest, the biggest problem Main Street is somebody trying to sell their own business. And it's not, has anything to do with success fees. It's mm -hmm. a very cumbersome process and there's a lot of legalities to it. And if you're running a small business, to be able to take your person out of that business and spend 30 hours or 40 hours a week taking care of paperwork, tracking down documents, learning what documents, your business falls apart. And the one big, uh, the two big uh, things that break deals are one, lo uh, decrease in performance after signed contract. And two, seller can't get, buyer can't get financing. Mm. So if you're a seller out there and you're thinking about selling your own business, if you have somebody to run your business, you're running your business 100%, you could take on the challenge, but you're not going to save any money. You'll pull your hair out. <laughs> and see, I've closed a lot of businesses, so I don't have any hair. <laughs> And hey, that's something that Curtis uh, said. He says, um, Curtis, he talks about when he bought a few of the businesses uh, because they were attached to the owner's name and brand, uh, like a lot of the business left. Uh, um, um, some of the partnerships left, you know. So, like, that's another scary part about doing the seller financing. If you agree to paying them a certain amount per month, but the, the the income goes down when the when the owner leaves. It's certain regular customers that are only going there because they know the owner. So guys, like anyway, we we we'll, we'll, we'll move on. No, man. Uh, it's a it's a great point, and, and I'm sure Curtis had some financial pain from experiencing that. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, if you can avoid a partner at all costs, please do. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's a risk that, you know, the reason why you use a broker is you don't fall into a lot of these traps exactly. because we've seen it happen. We can advise against obviously your decision to make. It's your investment. But that's why we're called business advisors. Exactly. Exactly. See, so guys, this is why we're bringing you the best of the best. He's the top guy in St. Louis. You hear me? Um, if you guys want to buy a business, this, this is the guy to go to. You understand? Even if you don't live in St. Louis, let me just be clear. This is yep, the internet. You can sell them all over the world. Yeah. This is the internet. This is virtual. We we're we're omnipresent. We can be anywhere right now online. Right. So yeah. if you want to like the right way to buy a business, you know, don't don't just go and buy all of these, uh, um, business buying courses that are going to. One of my students came, uh, uh, I did an interview with them, uh, me and Curtis, and he said that he bought a $3,000 course uh, from one of the top guru dudes. And inside the course, it was 200 ways you can buy 
a business with no money down. And he said it was just a whole bunch of like stuff that was confusing and crap. It's way better. Like, like one thing I've learned is leverage is the shortcut. If you can connect yourself with, with, with someone with experience, even if you have to pay something or whatever, uh, uh, this is a business broker right here, guys. This is a business broker right here. I would not go and buy some course or watch some viral video and then try to go and buy a business. Like you're just jacking yourself up for real, for real. Um, but yeah, let's let, let's continue. Um, oh, how does your professional network contribute to selling listings? Well, um, that's the interesting thing about our brokerage. We don't do a lot of advertising. We're a firm believer in building a referral partner network. Boom, we, boom, like, boom. Yeah, yeah. we have relationships with wealth advisors, uh, wealth advisor firms, um, uh, C CEPAs, certified exit planners. Um, wow. Other real estate agents, we have referral programs for real estate agents. So the, the key is getting in front of people that are managing money because typically people who run businesses have wealth managers. And sooner or later, they either want to age out, they age out, they want to retire, um, and they don't have a successor. Their kids grew up in the business. They want nothing to do with it. They've been running around the restaurant or running around that office for since they were five years old. They want nothing to do with it, right? They mm -hmm. want to cut their own path. So a lot of our businesses are good businesses that just quite simply don't have successors. Okay. Man, he just dropped some bombs uh, um, um, on the call with with one of the students, I think his, his name is Brandon. Okay, we went through this um, part of the session, me and Curtis, where we were talking about creating joint ventures and partnerships and stuff like that. And I was talking about how he can get direct uh, uh, access to businesses by partnering with people like business card uh, shops, uh, um, business sign shops, business loan brokers, uh, um, what was the other one? I, I can't remember. But you just pretty much went through that, like with <laughs> with what you were saying with the uh, wealth financial uh, advisors and all of that. So, guys, we don't just make stuff up. The top guys are doing this. Like he said, he doesn't even he really rarely advertises his network determines the net worth. When people when you hear people say that is not just some catchy line you you really don't have to just depend on yourself when you create this this moat around you of, of value, right? Like valuable connections and stuff. So that's what we're well, doing. And, and I, I pray that you guys do that too. Yeah. And for, for our business, because all of our listings are confidential, um, it's, it's a way for us to really get a warm, uh, contact. Um, our business has been driven by cold call contacts and drop notes and things of this, of this, in, of this nature. But I will, I, I will uh, second your thought. Networking is the way that if you're out there looking for a business, you have got to get out there and meet. Go buy all the businesses that you that you like and that you've driven by and never stopped in and just stop in and say, man, this is a good business. If you look around and say, this is a good business, tell me about this business. Yes. And you will find that, you know, obviously if they're not busy, entrepreneurs love to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> how they got started, the good things, the bad things. The, the, the grumpy people will always tell you one thing mm -hmm. I can't hire anybody in this place. <laughs> and that's because they're grumpy. Who wants to work for somebody that's grumpy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, have a smile on your face. I'm telling you, 
smiles, opens, makes things happen. You got to walk in there with a smile. And, you know, if you see an aging, a, a guy running a business in your local neighborhood that you think is a good business, go in there and talk to him. He may not have a successor and he may want to, if you go there and work for him, he may be interested in talking to you about a successor deal. Okay. But you got to talk to people like you're doing, right? You got to mm-hmm. get out there, get involved. Otherwise, you know, not, you can't sit on your couch and do this. <laughs> for sure, right? That's what this generation has been, you know, brainwashed to believe. Like, just sit on your phone or sit on your couch and the world will come to you. Maybe on TV, but in real life, you still got to do some stuff, right? So. That's right. There's nothing, nothing better than a warm smile, a firm handshake, whether it's with a female or a male. Um, it's just that personal contact that breaks. It's, it's playing. It's a thing that breaks the tie. Right. And if Mm -hmm. you think about, um, life, life is about doing the extra to break the tie. Right. Because if it's you or the other guy, think about when you were actively courting and dating. I mean, you did everything to beat that guy that, you know, was your competition. That's right. how you got to play life, and that's how you got to play uh, play business. You got to sure. figure yeah. out what the crack in the surface is. That's where you fit. And that's mm. why I'm passionate about this Dirty Jobs Legacy Program, because I, I, I think it can take a lot of hardworking people that will never have the wherewithal to become entrepreneurs, an opportunity to partner with somebody that spent his whole life building a business that may just go away one day when they die. Boom. Hey, um, make sure you send us um, a link to that. I'm going to put all of your contact information. Hey, y'all watching this right now. Um, if you have family members or yourself that want to partake in that uh, opportunity that he just told you about, what is it? He said dirty jobs. Dirty yeah. Jobs. Dirty, dirty, dirty jobs, legacy transit. Transition. Okay, so that's our, to- and we don't. And again, it's a pilot program. We're just starting out, so anybody that's interested, shoot me an email, and I'll put you on the list. And as right the program list. develops and we get more information, we'll put you on the mailing list, and we'll send you stuff out. For sure, for sure. Okay, and uh, those of you who want to sell a business, some of you guys might have a business. So you've seen the insight. So like he just told you, get out of your feelings. We have to like actually be grown ups when you when you want to sell your business, be a grown up. Like for some reason we can tell that to our kids, but when it comes to like business and going online or handling day to day tasks, we become infants and stuff. Like I, a lot of people come to me and they sound like they're about in between the ages of eight to 15 or something. And I'm like, dog, like you got to grow up, right? Okay. So, <laughs> for real, up. for real. So if well, you somebody's wanna... got a car alarm going on behind me, so it's not me. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that's cool. That's cool, man. Um, if you want to sell a business, Mr. Peter Rook, he's, he's the dude to go with. Uh, if you want to buy a business, he's the guy to go with. If you want to help uh, a business owner that, uh, wants to sell their business, we're going to work something with him where we'll be able to help them uh, be worth what they're trying to sell. We might be able to do certain things to make it a little bit more attractive uh, on the income and like the active cash flow side of things and stuff like that. But the point is, Mr. Rook is the guy to go to, guys. Um, We're going to interview other brokers and stuff like that, just so we have more uh, people to collaborate with. But I want you guys to know that I I went to him first because of his brand. I went to him first because of his positioning. When we, when we were searching, he was the top guy. He is the top guy in St. Louis. If you, if you search business brokers in St. Louis, You'll see right now, he, you know, Sunbelt Business Brokers of St. Louis is number one. I can see that. And I'm in Panama and it's still number one all the way out here. So he like they did their, their thing, you know, to get to the top of St. Louis. So they're, they're worth it. OK, 
So no offense to any other broker that I interview after this, but Mr. Rook is number one. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. We appreciate it's, it. It's one of the it's no one problem. of the few markets where you are higher. It's one of the few markets where you are higher than Transform or Trans World, which is I find very interesting as well. That, In fact, I used to uh, beat out I, Trans. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, in our organic, I, in our third quarter marketing review or quarterly business review, our organic hits on our Sunbelt uh, MLS, business MLS system, had five times the amount of organic hits that Transworld did. We had like 22,000 and they had like 4,700, 4, something like that. So see, so see, see, that snack pack is no joke. That, that when you rank your Google My Business listing at the top of Google, it's like uh it's like a flood for certain industries, man. It is it, it's, it's awesome. And and the people come to you. So let's let's add that up. He's the top guy in in Google in St. Louis, and he has all these partnerships, guys. When when you when you do that, you don't is is no struggle with business. See, so uh, a lot of you guys are struggling with business because you think it's some difficult, like unattainable thing. But it's it's really positioning yourself, positioning yourself to leverage others to profit recycle. That's that's all it is. Okay, uh, you know you've been sitting in the car for a while. I know that's uncomfortable. All right, so we got two more questions. All okay, right. all right. <laughs> All right. What additional services do you offer the businesses to, uh, you know, maybe uh, businesses that might want to increase their cash flow before they sell? Well, we offer what we call exit planning. I, I hate the word exit because exit is kind of a negative word. I like to call it <laughs> legacy planning. Um, but what we do is after we have done the complete valuation, we have a very clear insight of where the financial opportunities are. Um, so as it relates to the financial coaching, we can provide that on a continuing consulting basis. As far as the operational assessment, whether it would be at HR, doing, we can also do that. Um, one of my partners is certified in exit planning. And so if she, if we have a client that is a, has a two-year horizon or they really want to sell now, but they don't have the, uh, the leadership in place to make a successful transition at this time, then we help them formulate a plan to put those key players in place or address all of the cavities that they have that a buyer is looking for and typically that would be on businesses three million dollars or above okay you know if, if you're if you're getting below that i mean the, the the fixes are pretty simple either you show up to work more time or you get other people to show up to work you know okay. it, it's really probably kind of a simple thing in most cases it's operational cool cool man yo i'm learning a lot a lot, a lot, and I'm pretty sure the audience is learning a lot, a lot, a lot. Hey, I pray that you guys that are watching this, you take action, man. Like if you, if, you know, you guys seem to like the the videos we do on buying businesses. Okay, so that means that you are either interested in buying a business uh, uh, yourself or selling a business or something in in in, in that realm right there. So we're putting you in direct contact. Uh, with with a guy who's <laughs> he's owned pretty much all the Taco Bells that I've eaten at, you know, <laughs> getting off getting off of the Metro Link and going getting on the bus connectors, and then going to another Taco Bell, right? So, <laughs> and he's been in the game for a while, and now he's a broker, so you have direct contact with him. Uh, okay, we'll get this last question. How open are you to collaborating? Well, we probably already know the answer, but we'll, I just ask it anyway. How open are you to collaborating with educators and consultants to enhance the uh, we'll, we'll switch out the word value with like cash flow 
so that the business owners could increase the price? Oh, absolutely. Um, we have, uh, you know, we're always looking at developing partnerships that would help our client base. Um, we project that uh, within the next 12 to 24 months um, that we'll be doing a lot of cl client mentoring um, because what we're finding out is that interest rates are are go going to probably drive um, a hold status for businesses because obviously the, the more money you want to get at sale, um, it is somewhat interest sensitive based on the uh, the debt service that the new buyer would have to cover. So um, we are up to up to speed in. in in most areas of making recommendations on next steps. That's awesome. That's awesome. Listen, guys. So when I, I I've been pitching this entire time because uh, Mr. Rook is impressive. We want to be able to put you guys into in contact with more uh, uh, of our connections as well. Um, he mentioned exit planners. I never, I never really dealt with one of those before. So maybe we can uh, talk to an exit planner as well. What, what's the difference? What does an exit planner do versus a, um, yeah. Okay. So an exit planner does a complete assessment of the business. So they do a financial assessment, an operations assessment, a people assessment, um, your training, all of the major factors that drive your business at some level. Okay. Um, and so as, if we're talking, typically it's a $3 million up business. So you probably usually have anywhere between 25 to, you know, four or 500 employees, whatever the case may be. Um, so what we do right. is we identify the critical areas that are relevant to being marketable. So okay. in other words, do they have good credit? In other words, is the company paying their bills? Are they not paying them in time? Is that affecting their discount rates? Is it affecting their cost of goods? Because maybe they have the wrong person paying the bills who doesn't know how to use the computer system. You know, big problems sometimes have small causes and small solutions. So what we try to do is identify the red flags in all your salient aspects of your business model and bring them, then create a plan to bring those from red to green, okay. whether it's, you know, your short staffed or whether it's your pay, your accounts receivables are past or way past 90 days. Um, mm -hmm. you know, various things are in overall impacting not only the value, but the sellability. We call it buyer preparedness. Buyer preparedness. Buyers could want, yes. Buyers could want to sell, but are they prepared to sell? Boom. Wow. Big, See? Big step. <laughs> See, this is why I love interviews because it's like an, uh, an interactive, uh, um, like college course like condensed into like a couple hours or, or 30 minutes or something, you know, <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't know the, ter the terminology for any of this stuff, man. So I'm learning a lot. Man. Cool. So the more that we know, the more we'll be able to help businesses and help brokers and help uh, agency owners and stuff. What we're trying to do with agency to, uh, to partner is we want to help uh, the business brokers get, larger success fees by increasing, you know, uh, you know, what the, what the business owner will be able to sell out. So that just helps the business owner and it helps the business broker. But we also want to help the business buyer because now the business buyer will be able to buy a way more attractive business. Uh, uh, you know, like, for example, like we were talking about earlier, uh, me and Curtis, we specialize, uh, we create new revenue streams for existing businesses so that it, they look way more attractive. And these new revenue streams will be hands off. They'll be automated. They don't take any staff or training or anything like that. Uh, and, and we create extra assets as well for the business owner. So 
now when the business buyer is looking uh, looking at them, they'll be able to say, oh, snap, they have all these other assets, uh, um, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, in addition to the main business that we're trying to get. So and then we have the agency owners that we're trying to help because some of them, they're pretty much doing slave work, like a lot of business owners, uh, you know, will hire marketing agencies mm -hmm. and the marketing agency will bring them one hundred thousand dollars that month. And they'll still be making 1500 bucks stuck on retainer or something like that. So we're trying to unshackle a lot of different people through all of these partnerships that we're trying to put together. So uh, you are one of the people we've been blessed with, uh, uh, with being introduced to our finding and being able to introduce them to on this journey that we're all going to. And we're super grateful uh, to talk to you today, Mr. Rooks. Well, thank you very and, much. And truly, it's uh, I appreciate it so much. And um, if you ever have any questions, I'd love to come back again if you need me. Yes, sir. Definitely. 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 Absolutely. All right. Um, I'm going to let you go ahead and get back to your holiday. Hey, guys, okay. this is how you know he cares because it is as, as of this time, it is Friday right after the Thanksgiving situation. And he's in the car. He's been sitting here talking to right. us. I, and my wife has been patiently shopping. So we want to say, everybody, happy Thanksgiving. Hi. Hey. Uh, I see you. I, I see you. Uh, okay. All right. We'll, 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 you guys are at Macy's. So have a great time. Okay. We'll thank you very much. Bye -bye. All right, man. Enjoy your weekend, too. Okay. We'll talk to you see later. Ya. Thank you. Bye-bye.